Hello everybody, here is Taras and Ismail and today we'd like to talk about the architecture of package-based development. I bet many of you have ever faced the failing deployment. Some of you um, may wait for deployment to complete for 30 minutes, some of you one hour, others even more than one hour. Let's come up with the simple formula. Average waiting deployment time multiplied by the amount of people who are waiting for the deployment, multiplied by the average person salary. As a result, we will receive the amount of money that your company loses every time when the deployment fails. Today, me and Desmail would like to talk about the package-based development. We would like to share some mindset that you should have if you'd like to step on this journey and hopefully help you understand why, how, and when you should start creating packages and how to do it. Let's start. Today we'll talk about three types of application lifecycle management, LM models, DevOps tools and utilities, standards and best practices. We'll reduce and avoid technical depth. In depth, we'll talk about dependency injection in action talk about the work with packages, structuring, branch and strategies, have a small Q&A, and in the end, we'll share a list of a very good references. Salesforce exists for more than 20 years. And during this time, the way how people release, develop and maintain their applications have changed drastically. And not once, but multiple times. This way, how people release, develop and maintain their applications called application lifecycle management. And Salesforce has three. Change set based development, org based development and package based development. Let's talk about them in detail. Change set based development model. Change set basically is a group of metadata changes that need to be deployed from one connected org to another connected org. You can deploy change set only between the connected organizations. You cannot deploy the change set from one organization to another one. It should contain all the change metadata that should be deployed. Otherwise, the deployment may fail or your functionality may not work properly. It utilizes outbound change sets and inbound change sets. What are the pros of the change set based development model? This approach has straightforward, uh, straightforward processes, process. It's easy to understand and use. You don't need any additional tools or setup. It's good enough for smaller deployments, but don't be too happy. It has a tons of cons. All the changes need to be tracked by a change tracking tool. And unfortunately, most probably it will be Excel. It cannot be automated. It's very error prone to human mistakes. We are all humans. We can forget something. We can add some unnecessary additional changes that can break something. You cannot have destructive changes and you cannot have rollbacks. And there are many other cons, and I bet these are not all. If you know some additional cons, please leave the comment below. When to use the change set approach. If you have a very small project with a single person who configures the work, you may have a small number of changes to deploy. You don't need the version control and you don't want to have some automation. Let's think when actually we don't want to have a version control system or when we don't want to have automation. Not, not so often. So when to use the change sets approach? Basically never. Having said that, we are coming to one of the most widely used development models called org based. We finally utilize version control system to store metadata changes and project files. 
we introduce deployment job automation and our production org is the source of truth we create a sandbox from the production our sandbox stores all the metadata from the production and also the configurations and on the sandboxes we start developing our changes you by utilizing version control system we deploy our changes to other sandboxes and because of that we can keep our environments in sync it is as it was said before one of the most widely used development models the single repositories the single project repositories are often called monolithic projects this model has really strong pros it has very clear audit process list of changes and history all the work is centralized in version control system we may have automation we can very easily resolve all the conflicts and we also can have the destructive changes it's pretty good huh but we don't live in real um, in ideal world and we still have some cons even if in the beginning your repository may be pretty clean and structurized you may follow some good practices with um, in some time your project may become very big hence you have way bigger chances for the butterfly effect it is the anomaly when you develop one functionality in one part of your project and something completely unrelated breaks in different part of your project your deployment will get longer test will be running way longer as well hence the waiting time is longer people need to spend more money for the waiting it's getting pretty hard to onboard new people. You basically don't know where to start, from which, which business process to take, which piece of code to take and show to the developer. Sometimes your classes may lack the separation of concern and the same class may serve a lot of different purposes and be used by, reused by many projects. Hence, you'll have a lot of mess. When to use the org-based development model? It is ideal for teams that need a change process that will support multiple people who are working on your Salesforce project. Clear audit process, automation. You want to keep the environments in sync, have a clear conflict resolution. And having said that, I'd like to give a word to Ismail, who will, who will talk about package-based development in details. Thanks, Taras, for the introduction. And regarding the package-based development model, to put it simply, the metadata in your repository can be divided into folders. These folders can be subdivided further into package directories in your SFGX project JSON file. And from these package directory packages can be created and distributed to the target org. We can have three package types, unmanaged packages, managed and unlocked packages. Of course, we put in here the difference between the three of them. For example, the unmanaged packages are not upgradable, where the managed and the unlocked packages are upgradable. The unmanaged packages can be edited in the org, where the managed and unlocked packages cannot because the components are locked. The unmanaged packages mainly used to provide developers with the basic building blocks for an app, but the managed packages are typically used for partners to distribute and sell their app to customers. And finally, the unlocked packages are be more flexible to basically to make changes directly in the org, and they can play like a ground between the two of them, the two previous ones, and they have a password protected. And now we have to mention, or we can, we're gonna mention some pros um, for this model. Uh, first of all, they help us introduce a standardized way of work for multiple orgs at the company. They have a faster deployment and faster rollback. Each package contains a small number of metadata which helps to understand and create a mental model of how your org is structured, clear API control, clear audit trail of org evolution, release flexibility, scratch logs, and finally, my favorite, creation of reusable packages that helps us create better connections, basically, of other 
methods that we can keep reusing in different packages. And the cons, of course, we have some of them, even if we have a lot of pros, uh, that the cons can be overread. Uh, this model requires a high technical uh, architecture behind it and a more complex one. Uh, of course, high technical entry requirements. Uh, it requires package dependency support. And finally, there's a limit on the amount of the used scratch marks. And now we're gonna know when to use this model. So before my colleague mentioned some cons of these previous models and our package-based development model came to correct or to solve these problems. So we're gonna start with the butterfly effect, for example, that was mentioned before. This model solved this problem. And of course, when it's getting hard to onboard new developers uh, and when the business process is more complex. When we have a new project implementation with a technically strong team, and finally, when you have a multiple org company structure that uses the same core logic and requires some customization on top of the core logic. Now we're going to move to some DevOps tools and utilities. So, of course, we're going to start with the famous Salesforce DX and Command CLI. They are our main helper, our main tool on this journey, because they help us starting from the package creation using the Command CLI, then after that, the version control, by managing the package dependencies of the upgrades, then testing by automated testing via the scratch logs, and finally collaboration between other developers via the sharing code uh, feature. Then our Git, of course, the famous Git, everybody knows it, our uh, code management tool, CIC deployment tools that we're gonna go through some of them on the next slide. The Node.js, while it's not directly related to configuring our local package in Salesforce, it, um, yeah, it helps us build in applications that integrates with Salesforce and other web services. NPM, that as well, helps us manage independencies. Uh, and PMG and code scan that helps us ensure the, um, that our unlocked packages are built using a high quality of code. Uh, it identifies uh, security issues in our uh, code as well. Uh, it ensures that it complies with the best practices. And finally, it can be easily integrated with uh, other tools like uh, Git or Jenkins or even VS Code. And these are DevOps tools. So choosing the best tool for our unlocked package will depend on our specific requirements. And each tool has its own unique features and capabilities that make it more suitable. Uh, for example, Copado, it can be used when we need a comprehensive solution for managing the entire release process. It helps as well with data deployment uh, by creating data templates, by as well fast uh, metadata deployment as well. And of course, it can be automated during the whole process of the release management. Gear sets, when we need a cloud-based solution that is easy to use and offers a wide range of features. Uh, it's good to mention as well that it can be integrated with other tools such as uh, Jira and GitHub. Plosum, it's 100% built on Salesforce, so it's like the perfect solution sometimes if it fits requirements when we're looking for a CICD pipeline for our Salesforce project. And D, uh, DX Jenkins, uh, when we're looking for a flexible as well and customizable solution that can be integrated with other tools, not specifically in a Salesforce project, Snap CI, and finally JetRabbit. So yeah, ultimately the best tool for managing our unlocked package will depend on our needs in closing budget, um, complexity of the Salesforce environment, and finally, the team's level of expertise. And it's recommended to evaluate each tool's capabilities, uh, support, and ease of use before making any decision. And now I'm going to give back uh, the floor to my colleague to talk about the standard and the best practices. Before we will go to the practical part of our presentation, we should talk about a very important topic, standards and best practices in package-based development and architecture. We should have strictly defined specific naming conventions, including naming conventions for package namespace and package names, specific naming conventions for the metadata, you should define a strict package creation and update policy, but about that a little bit later. We should allow package feature enable and disable functionality. Sometimes it may happen that some of the customers would like to avoid having a specific 
feature in their work. You may have a few choices. You, you may create another package version specifically for this client, or the recommended way is to create a toggle functionality so you could fully um, organize and customize um, the package on your org. You should have a common company public document that contains a list of reusable packages for every team, a sort of internal app exchange. So then any person from any business unit could go to this document, have a look on the list of existing packages, and maybe this person will find something that could be installed in their org. Hence, we will save some money and some effort, and we will not create in the duplicated code. We should create and keep clear documentation for each created package. Nobody likes to create documentation. In the end of the day, after the hard day of work, we don't want to support it. But with the package-based approach, it's very important. Our documentation should contain a data model overview with the list of fields for each package object metadata. It should have a really detailed explanation about package installation and a clear list of manual steps that is required to make this package work. It should have a list of changes in package version, aka release notes. If you update your version, you can keep the list of changes. If you create a package, you should define there the functionalities that your package provide. It should have a clear API documentation and it's really applicable for the multi-org companies. Sometimes there may be the situation when organization A have older package version, organization B have newer package version, and at some point organization A would like to to check the documentation for the older version. This is why you need to have an archive of all the package version release notes, older ones and newer ones. Package governance. This is one of the most important topic. Before um, going to the package based architecture, you should define general architecture principles and NFRS compliance baselines. Um, you should decide low code over code, buy over build principles. You should have security, performance, scalability, and maintainability and NFRS aligned. You should have a common package template where you'll define a folder structure, naming conventions, configuration settings for all the packages. So then all the packages will have the same look and feel. You should have the architecture review board before you're going to create a new package or add an additional package dependency to make sure that your packages are, um, are following the general company architecture and vision. Also, you should have some regular architecture syncs with architects and your development team as well. When you want to update the package with some additional logic or you would like to add some trigger or some field or implement some business logic, everybody should be aware of these changes and it, everything should be aligned. Of course, very important point is the communication. Every package version release should be communicated in advance with all the package consumers. So then these package consumers could prepare themselves for the update and align some resources for the package update and package testing in their org. If you start a new project implementation or want to break down existing project to the packages, here are some ideas on how to do it. You may check your custom applications that you have on your org. You can check the logic based on App Exchange install packages. Check the open source frameworks and utilities. These are really good candidates to be extracted to the separate package. Some specific third party services and integrations. Or you may check for the reusable pieces of code. Some of the most common packages is the core package that will contain 
the core and reusable generic logic that you could install basically on every org it will also provide the possibility for the dependency injection it can contain force dependency injection library financial force library financial for mocks library and some other reusable functionality ui package that may contain the library of the reusable ui components such as dependent pick lists hierarchy trees and some other web components that could be installed on any org tip of tip of the day if you'd like to start your package creation journey don't start rewriting the core logic don't rewrite your triggers don't touch it because the probability that you'll change it and the amount of work um, that you will need um, to apply will be really high instead try to find some isolated process that can be easily extractable to the separate package and extract it to the separate package so then you could um, test how your packages work and understand how it works in depth let's see how we can reduce the technical depth there are a few common technical depths that um, that all of us are struggling with it is large and complex purely designed monolithic project this is the technical depth uh, in itself um, because of that our onboarding is getting harder butterfly effect but having the packages implemented the onboarding will go way easier we can introduce the single package to the consultant or to the de developer and explain him how the package works later on when we'll need to introduce another package we'll do it same code is duplicated be between the repositories and orgs so there are maybe a lot of cases when we duplicate the same code some reusable lightning web components reusable trigger functionalities reusable trigger frameworks and we need to support this um, this code in every org in every repository instead we can create a common package that can be installed in every org and we can move out all the reusable and generic pieces of code there at some point you may see that uh, you may you may find yourself that you are stuck with too many small packages and instead of developing the functionalities all what you do you are maintaining and updating the dependencies in the small project in the small packages and if you have a look on these packages they don't really make too much sense to avoid this situation you should have a very strong governance package creation process and you should all the new packages should be approved in architecture review board the last and the and the scariest problem is that your packages can be tightly coupled and be dependent on each other when you have the situation that to update a single package you need to update um, the parent packages you should be really concerned that means that um, your packages are lacking the separation of concern inverse of control and maybe dependency of injection having said that we are coming to the dependency injection section let me bring you some real life example and while you are listening to that try to find similarities with your salesforce implementations let me introduce our hotel manager bob bob may be a great guy but he does a lot of micromanagement he knows all the details about each team he has and um, he explicitly controls the work of each team he asks plumbers to plumb he asks kitchen to prepare main course and dessert he asks hosts to host and accountants accountants to calculate profit but what will happen if the kitchen would like to start preparing the salads bob will need to know this new feature that kitchen want to have 
and Bob need to remember that and control the kitchen so they will start preparing the salads. There is another problem. What if Bob will have another team to manage? He will need to understand all their functionalities, remember them and start controlling the another team. And the last problem, imagine that Bob, uh, Bob has done really good work and the hotel management decided to promote him and move him to another company branch. Our Bob knows only how to work with, with his specific team of plumbers, kitchen hosts and accountants. To be able to work in another branch, he'll need to forget everything about his team and learn from scratch how the other team work. Instead, as a good manager, Bob should stop doing the micromanagement and should come just with the list of his working standards that all his teams should follow. So then Bob will trust his teams because they are the professionals. They know how to do their jobs. He doesn't need to control them. And all what he will do, he will just ask them to work and he is sure that the teams are following um, his standards and the work will done. So in the end of the day, it doesn't matter for him, will he, will he have one team or two team or three teams? He actually doesn't care. He's sure that the work is done because they are following his processes and all what he does, he just asks them to work. It brings us to the design principle that is called inversion of control. This principle is aimed to improve the modularity of software and it is all about the callback or reaction to something. Instead of acting by ourselves, we'll be reacting to something that is happening. It follows the Hollywood principle, don't call us, we'll call you. As an example, let's see some really old GUI application that asks us to register a user and as you may see our main thread controls the flow of the user interaction first it asks the user to enter his first name then address then maybe the last name some other details and in the end our thread will save the record in the database with the inversion of control we are given the control from main thread to the user directly and now instead of controlling everything we'll be providing the reaction For now user has a freedom to put his first name at any moment put his address at any moment and save or register himself at any moment we as a computer program will just react in case the user wrote his first name, we will store it in the variable first name. In case user clicked the save button, we will start the registration journey. Having said that, we are coming to another design pattern called dependency injection. It stems from inversion of control. It, it aims to separate the concerns and it is all about removing the dependencies from implementation. The official documentation says dependency injection ensures that an object or function our hotel manager Bob which wants to use a given service our teams should not have to know how to construct those services our Bob doesn't need to know how each team works in details instead the receiving client Bob is provided with its dependencies with the list of the teams that he should manage by external code injector our hotel which is which it is not aware of so in the end our bob doesn't care which which teams does he have and how do they work our hotel will provide him with the list of the teams that he should manage 
he, uh, our Bob has the list of the standards, of the work standards that his teams should follow. And all what our Bob will do, he will ask, he will ask all the teams to work with his standards. It leads us to the loosely coupled programs. And this is the face of the Bo of Bob when he understood that actually he doesn't need to micromanage people anymore. Let's check the Salesforce example. We have a problem. We have an org that would like to install two packages, shipping package and payment package. Both of them provide some logic and both of them would like to publish error event log in case something went wrong. Question, how to solve it? The initial idea may be to provide the error log object in the shipping package and the error log object into the payment package. It is not really smart because we are creating two different objects that are serving absolutely the same purpose. With the package-based approach, instead, what we may have, we may create a core package that will provide us with the error handling event object and framework for error logging. Also, our core package may have the trigger framework. It may contain some generic trigger handler class and some uh, trigger observer metadata. As a result, our shipping package and payment package will be dependent on the core package, what means that they will know about the existence of the error handling event object, and they could implement the error logging logic with the using of the single and same object called error handling event object. Hence, we don't need to duplicate these objects. Also, as it was mentioned before, our core org wants to implement the shipping package logic and payment package logic. What it can do, um, our org customization can have an account trigger with implementation of the account trigger handler that will extend the generic trigger handler from the core package. And we will call the code from the packages explicitly in our account trigger handler. And now I'd like to give a word to Ismail, who will talk about the dependency injection in action. We're going to start our um, examples with a very simple one, and it's selectors. We're all familiar with the uh, enterprise uh, pattern, basically, when we use selectors and services. And in these selectors, we have methods, for example, get records, get record by ID, by search value. And these methods keep repeating themselves on each selector that is related to a certain object. So in uh, the example that is related here to our dependency injection is to use a dynamic selector in our core package where we can stack like the reusable methods that we keep calling in the other packages where we might have other selectors related to other objects. And this is like just a simple map, um, a custom object in a package B, an account a selector in, an, in a package A, and they all both call a method from a dynamic selector in our core package. And of course, they are both dependent to this core package. How are we gonna use that? Uh, in, uh, in details, we're gonna start by determining the input parameters in our uh, method in the dynamic selector. Then we construct the SLQL query. We use the database query, and then we return the records. And this is just a simple example of how we can use it. Of course, it can be customized, depends on our needs, and it can be, and we can of course use multiple ones in our uh, dynamic selector. And now we're gonna see how we can actually call this method. As well, very simple. We import it uh, in our, we import basically our core packaging uh, where we have the dynamic selector, we initiate the instance, and then we call the dynamic method. And again, this is uh, in practice how we can do it. We start by calling the dynamic selector. Uh, in our related example, 
we wanted to initiate a, a list of fields that we specifically want to get in our get record method uh, for a certain object. And then we can do whatever we want after we get well, uh, the records that we're looking for. So this is our first example. Now let's move to the second one, triggers. And we all agree that the best practice for designing uh, an automation process is one automation tool per object. Often we find different application teams make their uh, own choice of automation based on the scope of requirements. And so therefore lately they fall into performance issues or even uh, runtime errors. So the trigger fr handler framework is an excellent way to enforce this rule. And uh, uh, in our example, what happens when we have multiple packages that needs to introduce uh, one automation logic to a common object. We use the dependency injection. And we here uh, presented us a simple example of this trigger framework that was uh, done by uh, Takaito Miyamoto. And basically, we use a trigger handler to call the injector service to load the related automation configuration. And the custom metadata that is stored in the trigger observed metadata, you can see it on top of the uh, map. It controls how automation logic is invoked from different packages. And of course, this is an example again for the account trigger and how this trigger framework reacts to the actions that trigger it. That was our second uh, example. And our third is the events. And it's fairly common for one package to need to be notified uh, of an event occurring in another package. And this kind of communication is often uh, implemented by some kind of API calls. And the downside of this approach, as mentioned in previous slides, is can create tightly coupled packages and the integration between those packages, therefore it can be hard to maintain in the future. So that's where the dependency injection comes into action. And this is an example to show the benefits of it. Let's say we have in package A, a lead that is converted, and then package B, a service to update the existing account, and package Z, an email service to notify the sales manager, another package to have another uh, action. And we want to build a communication between these packages, of course, when the lead is converted. How we do that? So after impl uh, implementing the dependent injection, the package BNC subscribe to the convert lead events by adding entries in the event subscription custom metadata, including which class within the package should be called to handle the event. And when the event occurs, package A queries the convert lead event subscription metadata records to find out the package that has subscribed to this event, and then orchestrate class invocation based on the custom metadata entries. And this is like a map to show how we can distribute these dependencies. Of course, we always have a core package that have dependencies between the packages that want to build this canal of communication between each other. And uh, after those two examples, we're gonna see now in real life, uh, an application of, the, uh, of this model of this dependency injection with my colleague Taras. Let's create some payment processing app. Company A's branch in Poland would like to create a new component that will allow customers to buy their services through the portal. The payment component should support Blick.pay and Pshalevi24. The initiative was a huge success, resulting in 10% increase in the number of orders. Other country company branches are also interested in, implemented, in implementing similar system, but with different payment processing options. Luckily, our developers and architects predicted the possibility that other branches would like to implement similar systems. So instead of hard coding the .pay, Blick and Pshalevi implementation directly inside of the payment component, they decided to start creating packages and using the dependency injection. Let's see how they did it. They came up with the following logic. They've created a core payment package with the 
core Lightning Web component and its controller, this core LWC plays a role of a container. They created some payment interface class called iPayable that our payment services should implement always. And payment metadata config object payment observer metadata that will tell our Lightning Web component which exactly services needs to be displayed inside the container. On top of the core package, they've created additional packages called Blick package that stores specific implementation and logic for the Blick payment service .pay package and Pshalevi24 package. All of these packages have the payment observer metadata in, inside this in, in, inside their packages. So then our LWC could find this record and render the proper payment service. Because of the implementation of the packages, any package can be uninstalled at any moment, but maybe we can install other payment services like PayPal, Apple Pay, World Pay, Ideal. We just need to develop an additional package and install it directly on the org, provide the proper metadata config record. Let's see the work of our component. First of all, we initialize our core payment component, our container. After the initialization, our core payment component is searching the payment observer metadata records that are provided by each of our package. Our core component finds the payment observer records that store the information about the name of the payment service, Blick, Pshalevi, PayPal, Apple Pay, and the name of the specific package service class that should be called when the user will click on the specific payment service button. Thanks to that, we can install and uninstall any package at any moment. And we can luckily install the payment core package to other countries and install their different payment services. Now we'll talk about the package structuring work and release strategies. Initially, our monolithic project has 100% of customization inside the repository. Our purpose is to minimize the customization as much as possible, so we'll be left with around 15% of the customization. Other pieces of logic should be taken to the packages and installed directly on the org. And then the role of our customization is to call the specific function, call and orchestrate the specific functions that are provided by our packages. This diagram may help you with the creation of the packages. In the base ground, we'll have a core package that is fully generic and reusable. It provides us with universal, non-business specific functionalities like trigger frameworks, testing frameworks, and other reusable functionalities. The other layer of packages may be a specific custom general business service application or module like telecom solution, financial cloud, or HR related application. On this level, we may introduce the solutions data model. Capabilities may be a lead management functionality or recruitment capability or time tracking capability. With the features, features are specific implementations for some specific requirements like lead conversion, days, um, 
days of calculation, reporting calculation, um, specific payment service implementation. Work strategy. We have two ways of work strategies. First one is the sandbox development approach, where um, we are working and creating our unlocked packages inside the sandbox. So it may make sense at the beginning of the journey for the existing projects, when you just start breaking down your monolithic projects to the smaller packages. You can install the unlocked packages to the sandbox org and play uh, with these packages on the sandbox. And after you've created the first package, it makes sense to start translating to the scratch org based development where you'll be using the scratch orgs. Scratch org development approach. Scratch orgs are temporary, on demand, clear, clean orgs. They don't contain any metadata from your production. They may, but they don't. Um, it follows um, the agile and iterative development principles. It is the nature of truly source-driven SFDX approach, and it follows separation of concerns principle because um, so, um, scratch orgs are coming uh, fully blank and empty orgs. You can install there only the required um, metadata, your required package functionality, and it will not interfere with other functionalities. So you can create the scratch org for implementing of the specific feature or task. And once you are done, you can delete the scratch org. Both of these um, approaches, they uh, have their pros and cons. And with the sandbox development approach, you need to have the regular sandbox refresh. And our sandbox contains all the metadata from the production. So unfortunately, you cannot work specifically on the specific um, package functionality because you have an access to the other metadata. With the SFDX, you may have the completely blank environment. It allows you to deploy only the required package metadata and you can create a lot of instances. Unfortunately, Scratch orgs, they are temporary orgs and after 30 days, they will expire. So if you'll be using the Scratch orgs, please make sure that you are retrieving your code regularly. Otherwise, if you'd like to retrieve the code on the 31st day, of the um, scratch work existence, you will not be able to do that because scratch work will be removed. Um, with the newly created scratch orgs, um, sometimes you may need to, to upload some data and also you may need to install some package and package dependencies. So what you need to have is automation. With the scratch org based development, the Automation is inevitable thing. You need to have the automation to install the packages, install the dependencies, provide some data loads to be able to develop and um, create some new features for your packages. Now we are coming to the branching strategy. Our package branching strategy may be looking in the following way. We may have three branches main, develop, and feature. On the feature branch creation, we can create a new scratch org where we will install the package content and where we'll, we will be developing our new feature or our new logic implementation. After we are done, we will raise the pull request to the develop branch after the raising the pull request, we will launch the CI CD processes, uh, which will include the deployment validation job. The deployment validation job contains the following steps. We'll create a temporary scratch work. We will try to deploy current, um, current package context, uh, context 
we will run the test and if everything works fine we will automated user will approve the pull request and will delete the test scratch org we also can run some apex test coverage checks we may also run some sonar cubes checks if we want of course and after everything is fine validated and approved by the automation user and approved by um, the senior colleague or your um, colleague developer we can merge it to the develop branch once the pull request is merged to the develop branch our automation job will create a new version of the package at that point this new package new package version can be installed on any sandbox but not to the master uh, not to the production to make sure that our package can be installed on the production we should release this branch but we will talk about it a little bit later let's check the local org branching strategy by local org i mean the specific organization repository if we would like to install um, the new package or install a new version of the package to some specific org we may have the automated process for that as well we will create a branch from the develop branch let's call it feature one and in this branch all what we need to do we need to find the sfdx project json file that is created automatically when we create the sfdx project in in visual studio code and um, there we just need to add the information about package or we or we need to introduce the package or we need to update the package version in this file once we are done we should raise a pull request against the develop branch then we will run some local ci cd logic in addition we will check if we have the new version of our package if yes we will try to install the new package version check if everything works if our tests are still passing and if yes automated user will approve the pull request after all the checks and when um, the pull request is approved we will merge it to the develop uh, to the develop branch and we will install it to the we will install our package to the um, proper org like sat or uat or any other org that you have in your branching strategy if you want to install this package further like uet org you should just create a new pull request from the develop to the appropriate branch now if we would like to install our package to the production organization uh, to the pro production org we should first release it so then after our package has been tested a few times and approved that everything works fine we can create a pull request to the main branch inside our package repository our pull request will trigger the ci cd processes chain again once everything is approved and validated we will merge our package to the main branch and once the pull request is merged we will not create a new package version but instead will promote or release this newly created package version congratulations since now you can install this package version to your production once the package version is released we are creating the pull request inside our local org to the main org and once the pull request is is approved our package has been already released we are merging the pull request and we are updating the package version in our production org questions and answers time
there were a few questions that were asked in upfront and I would like to answer them. The first question is, is there a commercial tool that would help with packaging of second generated unlocked packages? As the answer, I can tell you that, please um, check the previous slides. We've listed the list of some DevOps um, tools and utilities that could help you with your unlocked packages journey. What is the package repository structure? As well, we have a specifically dedicated um, slide for that. It's called branch and strategy. Go a few slides back in this presentation and you will find the answer. Um, just an additional information for the packages. You may have the single repository per package. You may have multiple packages inside a single repository, or you may have the submodules basically inside the single repository you may have the sub repositories per package as well what is the devops structure for package-based deployment this is a very subjective um, topic because it depends on your project itself on the budget on the budget that you have on the amount of the processes that you have and you need to support and also your branch and strategy. Do you recommend to have a separate deployment team for packages based deployment or try to teach some developers um, prior to starting the project? What are the pros and cons? So from my experience, there is no need to have a specifically dedicated deployment team. It would be enough that in the beginning of the implementation of the project, um, you will have a few good um, DevOps guys who will create a really cool um, pipelines for you and who will create the really good automated jobs for you. So then um, everything else can be handled by the developers. By that, I mean that um, the new package version creation, the package release can be automated and uh, the work of the developers will be just to create the pull requests properly and raise it to the proper branches. Governance is always important topic of every project, how it will be affected by the proposed model. So um, the specifically dedicated slide for the governance is in here in our presentation, but just um, to, I, I will tell it again that we need to have the really strong package creation and uh, dependency ad additions policy to, to not find ourselves in a bunch of small packages that really don't make any sense. We need to be really careful with that. What are the tangible benefits and selling points for the business? So packages in its nature don't provide any, any business benefits, business related benefits. So when you will be talking with, with, with business about introducing um, the unlocked um, or package-based development, um, you should talk about NFRs, non-functional requirements, such as risk mitigation, um, deployment failing time, disaster recovery, documentation clearance, maintainability, performance, portability, reusability. We, it will be also easier to onboard new people and as I said before, the main thing is that we don't need to wait really long for the tests to complete their run. And if something will fail, um, we don't need to wait too, too much time. Also, if some piece of functionality is not ready, but other one is ready in different package, we can install one package and wait with the second package. We don't need to play around and um, find uh, the solutions, how to extract our non-working code from the working one and uh, find some strategies. We can, we can just have these two pieces of logic in two different packages. 
how hard it is to find professional with package-based development skill set. Is it worth starting a big implementation project, 30 plus people in the dev uh, development team with this approach? If you need to hire the team first, what is the ramp up period for the team in your experience to get up to speed? So I would say that it is as hard as to find the good Salesforce professional in the Salesforce ecosystem. Um, you don't need to look uh, or search the developer who, who has worked um, with the packages. Actually, there are a lot of good materials in the trailhead on how to create the package, um, how to release it, how to create the new version. What you need to be looking for, you need to be looking for the architect who who has the knowledge how to work with the modularized applications and also the developers who know who know how to create um the reusable and generic applications um, these developers actually don't need to come uh, from salesforce itself also they may come from java because it's pretty popular there uh, to create the modularized applications um, and if you are talking about the big and large amount of people in the development team 30 plus most probably they will be working in separate teams like i know six ten people per team it will be it would be good to have one person inside the team who has the experience with working with unlocked packages or packages or some modularized development who will be able to control the structure of the work that is being done and um, the way how people do it and also um, he should be able to provide some knowledge transfer session about the way of thinking that you should follow when you are creating um, the logic inside your packages and some tutorials how how actually to create your package it's really important to to have a strong devops team as it was said before so if you have a pretty good pipelines and pretty well defined pipelines that that are working cr clearly and easily um everything should go smoothly so of course um, the people who don't have the experience with creation with, with working with the packages will struggle a bit but i think the ramp up period may be i know one time uh, oh, sorry one month with uh, a few knowledge transfer session from more experienced people uh, because the developers who have never worked with the packages they should uh, let's say try to create a new package version try to release it maybe fail a few times but after a few a few times of work with these packages they will be fine what are the factors that contribute to the failure success of project with package-based development approach there are a few of them first of all is of course the technical uh, knowledge of people who are working on the project so it should we should have the um, experienced architects and experienced developers this is the first and main point and second point of course is business so um, it really depends how much money you have um, how much money what is the project budget um, how well the business understands the reason to implement the package-based development um, how loyal the business is to the failure during the package-based development package creation or package updates and if we are talking about the um, monolithic uh, projects the big ones sometimes actually it doesn't make too much sense um to transform um, or break down the project into the packages sometimes uh, the project may be really well defined and uh, the project may follow really um, good uh, good um, patterns principles and strategies that it works fine with the mon with the monolithic repo 
and it just doesn't make too much sense to um, to implement the package based approach so it should be really well thought but if you'd like to to introduce the package based development to the business then of course you should do it in a really clear understandable for business way and um, try to hire experienced people with the knowledge how to create the modular based applications but this but we, we with a few trials and fails everything will work that was it thank you very much in the end of this presentation you will find the list of the um, really good references you will find a few videos that you may watch uh, these are the experiences um, of the people who switched who have switched to the package based development and also some good to read articles that also will share some experience how to tran transit yourself to the package based development you will find here some trailhead about about the unlocked packages so it definitely worth to have a look Thank you very much.